Good morning. Good morning. I hope that everyone had a wonderful summer break and that you're ready to get started and in the new year with our commitment to high performance. And part of that is working today to collaborate more effectively about our services and how we can support our schools and our students and our community. We would like to welcome everyone to our first meeting of the new school meeting is held and hosted today by the superintendent for all coordinators and above. We thank you for your support in the previous school year and again we're looking forward to your collaboration in the new school year. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome to the podium our superintendent of schools, Dr. Morsi J. Beasley. Jada, thanks team, everyone for being here on today. How are you all this morning? Well, thank you. You all are our guinea pigs. I want y'all to know that now. Um, we decided this year, if you came to the meetings last year, when we rolled out the critical conversations, you know, being the superintendent, the first year superintendent, we um, basically addressed a few topics, high level, and I was the one who basically was, uh, who led the meetings after Jay had introduced me. Well, this year, now that I've been broken in real good, real good, uh, we decided that we would approach things a little differently. And so this is officially our first meeting using this format. So you'll give us good feedback, okay? Good feedback. And really the purpose is to ensure that not only are we informed internally, but to ensure that our external stakeholders are also informed and engaged um, and have the information that I believe will help them become good advocates for the work that we're doing on behalf of our children in our school system. So I'm going to move away from the, the podium and other presenters. You feel free to stay up right here at the podium if that's what you choose to do. But I, I want to move away from the podium. And so today we're meeting with coordinators and higher this morning, and then this afternoon we'll meet with the uh, support staff. And we try to give each group their own unique meeting so they can feel comfortable interacting and sharing whatever concerns that they have that's uh, relevant for their particular area, their particular role, etc. And it's always good to have like-minded people sometimes who may see things differently or at least like roles together so they can share and hear from each other. And then it allows you, those of us who are leading the presentation, if a common concern or accolade comes up uh, consistently, you can make some notes about that and hopefully make uh, efforts to uh, address that. So today, um, the presentation really is to give all of us an idea of what we're doing as a district to move toward high level of performance. I want to say first, thank you all for a great uh, last school year. It was my first year superintendent. And I don't think I could have asked for a better first year. It was just a great experience. It was a tiring year. Um, but I often say you're going to get tired uh, doing what you like or doing what you don't like. At least we're getting tired doing what we like, right? And so I want to acknowledge all of you, everyone in this room, you contributed to the work. If you were here last year, you contributed to the work that we did. You contributed to the outcomes that we achieved, that we are achieving, and data continuously rolls in. You contributed to the outcome, and you should be very proud of the work that you are doing. Um, and I want you to be motivated and encouraged to do the work even more because clearly the data is telling us that we're going in the right direction. So let's start out with our vision and mission. And once I get through my part, we'll let the others, and I guess before I do that, I want to introduce and see, um, making sure I cover all my bases. Let's introduce all the, uh, the deputies and chiefs. Uh, first of all, I want to, uh, Dr. Simpson is the uh, deputy superintendent of school leadership and improvement. He's not here. Um, We've got Dr. Smith, we are, I think I saw Dr. Smith, Deputy Superintendent, Second Command of, of Government Relations, Partnerships, and Operations now. We're shifting operations on the Dr. Smith. Sam, so everybody can see Dr. Smith. I know everybody can see Dr. Smith. Oh, I already know this guy. 
are motivating, who are encouraging, who go that extra mile, one or two or three or four or five. Why? Because they see that potential in you. They see the future that they want you to have. And they know the impact that you were, you were going to have or you would have in your future, in your life. And we have to be that for all of our children. All of our children. Those who seem to be doing well and those who seem to be struggling with their own personal issues. Here are our four beliefs. So I want everyone to take a second to look at those four beliefs. Because during our strategic revision process, we came to the conclusion that these are the things that we believe. And if these are the things that we believe, then they should be aligned with our actions, or our actions should be aligned with what we believe. We believe our children have priority for all of our resources. Every decision should be about our children and mitigating the impact of negative things happening that impacts their environment to our children. We believe education is a shared responsibility. I can't do it alone, you can't do it alone. It takes all of us to provide the best educational experience for our students. We believe communication and understanding among stakeholders of a diverse community are essential. Communication and understanding. I learned years ago, you learn to communicate, and then all you get is get a what? Get an understanding. Make sure you understand what the work is, what your role is in the process. We believe that learning is a continuous process. And so wherever we ended in May, we've been learning, and our students have continuously been learning throughout the summer. And when they start, those who started at Phoenix College from yesterday, they continue to learn. Those who start on August 6th, they will continue to learn. It's a process. Everybody say process. It is a process. And it's our role as central office staff members is to ensure that we implement processes that support the learning environment, that support the learning process. Most productive the needs of students of each child are met through high quality instruction provided by competent and caring adults. Competent and caring. Both are important. Competent and caring adults. And then we believe a learning environment where everyone experiences security, care, dignity, and respect is essential. It's our responsibility as the, the, the central office team, whether you're here today or those who are not here, but it's our responsibility to ensure that we exemplify these core beliefs. It's my responsibility to model those four beliefs in our decision making, in our interactions, etc. Here are, are our five strategic goals. These are the goals that all of us are working on. I'm held accountable as superintendent for these goals. Those who sit on the superintendent's uh, cabinet are held responsible for these goals. Those individuals hold their departments and divisions accountable for achieving these goals. So it should be very clear what we're all working toward. No one should be un uh, confused or no one should be unclear as to what we're working to achieve and what we're working toward. The first goal, we've got to increase academic achievement, period. And it has to be evidenced by all the various assessments that our students are expected to take. So whatever's happening in the classroom, if it's working, it's got to show up in our data, doesn't it? You can't say that we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing all these great things, but then our data is consistently going in the wrong direction. We've got to figure it out. And so the first goal is to increase achievement for all students, not just those who are in regular ed, not just for those who are in special ed, but all students, English language learners, special ed, black students, white students, Hispanic students, all students across the board. Male, female, all means all. To provide and maintain a safe and orderly learning environment. I often say, children do not create the environment. The adults create the environment. And so it's the expectation that every school is safe, every school is orderly. It's 
the expectation that we, where we work at the central office in our various departments, that it's safe and work. Only. Nobody wants to come and spend most of their week in a chaotic environment, do you? No, you don't. So matter of fact, if you don't spend a lot of power in these, you don't ever self-actualize if you're not safe. If you don't feel safe, if you don't feel supported, if you don't feel like you're in an environment where you can thrive, you'll never reach that highest level of, of, of you or whatever that is. To create an environment that promotes active engagement, communication, accountability, and collaboration of stakeholders to maximize student achievement. Notice it says to create an environment. All of us in here are responsible for creating that environment. I'm responsible for creating that environment. You're responsible for creating that environment. Principals are responsible for creating that environment. Teachers are responsible for creating that environment. Bus drivers are responsible for creating that environment. Luxury workers are responsible for creating that environment. All of us are responsible. So it can't be just a job to you. As a matter of fact, this organization doesn't need people who just need a job. This organization needs people who see this as a passion of their lives, a ministry, if you will, that this is the purpose that I've been called to. It may not be the purpose for your entire life, but for this moment and this time in my life, this is my purpose. This is what I've been called to. So if you just want a job and you want to kind of do your own thing, I, I, I'll tell you this, you won't be happy. You will not be happy. You won't be, I don't care who your superintendent is, you'll never be happy. You said, that superintendent, that Dr. Dean Meek has hurts me. Listen, nobody hurts me that, that much. You know why? Because I'm good with where I am in life. I'm good with what I'm doing in life. And you know, there's something on the inside. Got to show up where? On the outside, right? To provide high quality support services delivered on time and within budget to promote high performance. Support services, whatever support that our schools, our students need, that's our role. Action of supporting schools, what would be our purpose? There's no purpose for us to exist, is it? And if you ever want communities to demand get rid of the central office hope, deviate from your purpose. When a community values the work that you're doing to support children in schools, guess what? They don't talk about getting rid of support, central office hope, because they understand the role that central office plays. To recruit, develop, and retain highly qualified and effective staff. You are sitting here today, you've been recruited, you've been retained, and we want to ensure that you are developed. All of us, all of us have to continue to learn, myself included. So these are our goals. All the work that we're doing is to achieve these goals. Now we mentioned the goals first because we wanted all of us to really get an idea as to what we're working toward. And honestly, while there are five separate goals, there's really one goal. And that's the goal of high performance for all students. For all students. So all of us must ask ourselves a question. What are we going to do to ensure that in our particular role, divisions or departments, that we are doing what it takes to ensure that we contribute to creating that environment in which all students perform it at very high levels. What are we going to do? I often say, as adults, as adults, you've got to be good with who you are and where you are in order to focus on children. In order to focus on children. In order to keep your focus on children. Keep your focus on supporting schools, on supporting teachers, and supporting principals, etc. So, at this time, what we'd like to do is allow that. I'm going to pass the baton to the various departments. Jacob? Um, oh, here we go. I was just wondering what happened to my definition. I want everybody to look at the definition. Look like this. Look like this. 
out of our order. Look at the definition. Take a second of high performance. So, those are some key, some key phrases or terms you see in there. Let's give you the first one that's important to you. Yes, sir. Very good. Got to implement, right? Evangeline, what's important to you? Measure outcomes. What does that imply to you? Okay. Okay. Now, Evangeline, what area are you responsible for? So for your particular area, you, you have you have measurements identified that you are using to determine if we're moving in the right direction? Very good. And that will be important. April? Intentional? Why does that jump out?
your measures improve, your outcomes improve, you must ensure that you're implementing the right strategies. If, if the strategy worked for you last year, that's great. How can you refine it to build up momentum and accelerate your improvement? Take your improvement to higher levels. So, what we're going to do right now is go very quickly through this. And this is not everything that we're doing. But I want you to notice, and I, someone asked me a question, I was somewhere recently, they said, well, what programs are you implementing? And I paused and I thought about that question. And all the years that I've been in education, um, superintendents come and they go, and programs come and go with superintendents, don't they? Yes, they do. So I made a point to let them know that we're not really implementing a program. I said, as a matter of fact, when you talk to my team, it's not about programs. It's about culture and actions that create a culture of high performance. As we are implementing actions that create a culture of high performance, there may be some tools that we're using, but we're not defining our work by one particular what? Tool. It's just a tool. Our work is cultural work to create a culture of high performance. All of us have to ensure that we are high performers. We're working together as high performers so we can create a culture of high performance. And so as the others will come, they'll take you through, again, some of the things that we're doing that we've done that we'll continue to do to create that culture. What I want you to see, I want you to put the puzzles and piece of the puzzles together. And I want you to see this picture, if you will, of high performance that we're creating. So, with that being stated, we're gonna start with the data because you need to know where we are. Some of this data is, is um, in, in comfort, or what is it called? I forgot the word. Embargo, thank you all. It's embargo, but you need to know as a team where we are with our data. So as we work together, as we strategize, we can start moving and start accelerating this data toward achieving the goals and performance objectives that we've identified. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Tapper. Dr. Tapper, I'm up here on the stage, and I think I want to come down. But if you want to come up, they think you can see me. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so real quick, of course, as Dr. Reese spoke, this data is embargo, or our embargo. Uh, don't take any picture of it, it's anywhere else. Yeah. All right, so what we want to do is pretty much take a snapshot of where we've been for the past uh, four to five years and see where we're going. And for a fair comparison, we'd like to compare ourselves to the average of the state and our metro area, our PD school districts. So if you look at our EOC trends, and we've done something different this year than we've done before, don't we look at uh, developing, proficient, and distinguished. But this year we decided to look at, at proficient and distinguished students in the categories that they fall. So right now, going back to 2014, we decided to just segregate the data by proficient learners and up, and this is where we fall. So 2014, you have to look at the ninth grade here, it's just an example, that 30% of our learners at uh, this level above. Uh, 16, 28, 17, 34, 2018, we are right now, 34%. And so what you notice, and you probably notice right off the back here, that some of this data remains stagnant. So it's a good starting point for us to continue forward. Some standards have changed in curriculum, so that means that uh, they got more rigorous. And this doesn't tell the whole story. We do have a lot of developing students. We also have a lot of students who fall in the uh, efficient category versus the distinguished. And these numbers may have changed in a way that you see for the past. We may have had 17% that were uh, proficient and maybe 3% that were developing. I'm sorry, distinguished. But now we have a higher number of students in the distinguished categories. But this is overall trend for us for the past uh, five years, four to five years for EOC.
And here we are for the EOG, which again consists of our third grade grade. And for comparison purposes, we look at the Metro Risa, the surrounding schools, uh, and the state of Georgia. And this is where we fell this year. Some improvements, slightly improvements again, but it's uh, spot momentum to get going forward. Starting small and increasing every year. We did lose footage in some areas, but again, I think we can uh, make that up this upcoming year. One thing I would like to see us do is break that barrier to three points higher. I think it's possible this year. Now for science, we uh, stay in, again, we lost, that's, that's one area we lost footing in, uh, in fifth grade, just down by one point, but we gained a little slightly in eighth grade. But as you can tell, we're still slightly behind our metro area, uh, schools around the schools, and the state of Georgia. And for science, we have a little bit of social studies. Okay. Next, we have AP students. This is a good telltale sign that we are moving in the right direction. I know there's a lot to go through one snapshot, but what I want to show you, put your attention to, is down here very very bottom, you notice know, that these years we started, we had a dip here, but last year we definitely increased the number of students taking AP courses and scoring three or higher, three or higher. I remember at one time, I believe it was in 2015, we had uh, at one particular test and we had less than 3% of the population passing three or higher. So we're glad to see this number has increased. That's great. We still have ways to catch up with the metro area and also with the uh, School get uh, paid for Georgia. Now, this is for SAT. What we have here, I just want to display the uh, mean scores for 11th grade and 12th grade for 2017 and 18. So, if you read this correctly, our average mean score here, we did drop a little to five points. But one thing to note is that we have less students taking the SAT this school year. So, from 11th grade to 12th grade, 2017 and 18, we have five, uh, we lost five points. But notice here, 25% uh, in 2017 met the benchmark, and this year 28% met. So our evidence, evidence and reading and writing, evidence based reading and writing, our benchmark here, slightly increased 2% from last year. But we also increased, though, so, uh, in our mean score mathematics, 30% met the math benchmark. And so likewise, for 12th grade, we did drop off you know, a little bit more here, but we did increase those who both met the uh, benchmarks, 18% and 17%. And for evidence-based uh, writing, and read, uh, yeah, reading and writing, uh, we did drop a little bit more there. But I guess our hope uh, this year is with our math scores going up, and also with the uh, addition of more students taking the test, so forth. I think with SAT day in preparation that we have on the wraps that we're working toward, I think this is something that we can accomplish here quite easily. Thank you, Dr. Goals. 
Dr. Tapper spoke about our data and our strategic plan is designed to support our data, to increase our student achievement. That is our ultimate goal. Our strategic improvement plan was approved by the board in December. We revised the plan. It took us about two years to revise the plan to help with the transition of our new superintendent. So we decided to continue to modify our plan to ensure that we are working on the work that Dr. Beasley's vision supported. So with that being said, everything that you will hear today will support our strategic improvement plan. When you get to federal programs, that supports our strategic improvement plan. Our teaching and learning supports our strategic improvement plan. Student services, every department in this district is supported by the strategic improvement plan. For those of you that do not know where to find our plan, it is located in multiple lo places on the website. You can find it on the main page under plans and reports. You can also find it under our Board of Education in the e-board. You can also find it for those of you that are members of the different committees for the superintendent. It's located in those areas as well. I suggest you review the performance objectives, which are listed on this document. The performance objectives and the action steps are listed on this document. The difference in how it's worded on here and in the actual strategic improvement plan, our action steps on this document says we will because we want our community to understand that we will work on this work. We will do our best to achieve our goals. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to the next person so they can explain how their department or their area supports the strategic improvement plan. Thank you. 
involved in our academically challenged classrooms. So that means that we're doing an active move to move to improve the number of students who are getting into gifted and honors classes, advanced placement, taking advantage of dual enrollment, making sure that we're taking uh, high school courses at the middle school level and college classes at the high school level. We are also, one of our updates is to make sure that while we are strengthening those instructional practices that we're getting into our schools and making sure that we're doing focus walks so that we can provide the support necessary for those schools. That means that though we're getting in there, we're looking at what they're doing, is it appropriate, and are we using the intervention, intervention strategies and tools necessary. We're also frequently looking at our assessments. So that means are we looking at those formative assessments from district benchmarks to intervention, um, the reading and math intervention assessments, the common assessments that the teachers are using in the classroom. How are we helping them with, with resources and support there? And finally, our real foundation here is making sure that we're collaborating with our community and our families and making sure that we are continuing our support of learning throughout the day and in the evening. And I think that our key statement here, uh, this is what real life is. We need to read something, we need to write something, and we need to solve something every single day. Teachers are engaging in rigorous instruction. 
construction that is aligned with the assessments, so our assessment results will, uh, will increase year after year. High performance culture and climate training, as Dr. Beasley said, we can't do anything if we don't have the right culture, if we don't have the right working conditions, uh, if uh, teacher and staff morale is not where it needs to be. Because people who are not happy will not get to that place of self-actualization and performing uh, to their optimal level. Aspiring principals cohort and coaching institute for academic coaches, uh, as we are preparing, and our new principals induction, as we are preparing, uh, we have to prepare the farm system of those who will eventually replace us. Uh, because our, our uh, uh, we have the, the responsibility now, but we always have to be preparing that next wave of leaders so that they're very critical. Monthly principals meetings and the professional learning communities by elementary, middle, and high school clusters. So we support all of that. Accountability, uh, Dr. Wiley shared about the strategic plan about the performance objectives and about the action steps. Uh, we have worked very diligently to make sure that everything is aligned for this year. Uh, so Dr. Beasley and uh, Dr. Wiley shared a little bit about the strategic plan. Uh, the schools will have a comprehensive school improvement plan this year, and we revised the format completely so it will be perfectly aligned with the strategic plan because as per Dr. Beasley, Beasley's vision of coherence, uh, we need to do a few small things and we need to do them very, very well. Uh, and we don't need to have a lot of different objectives and action steps in different plans that don't align with one another. So part of our strategy is that focus and that coherence. The district focus walks, we will continue those this year to provide feedback and to partner uh, with teaching and learning and to partner with professional learning to provide appropriate support as well. And our strategic improvement plan, we talked about that, the key high performance indicators. Cool choice. Good morning again. School choice also falls under school leadership and improvement. It is a fairly new department within our district, although we've had some magnet programs for about nine to ten years. But school choice includes pre-kindergarten, which is under the direction of Angelon. It also includes student transfers for House Bill 251 or hardship transfers, which falls under student services, and also magnet programs and career academy, career academies. Right now we will have one new career academy for the 2019-2020 school year, and if anyone asks, please let them know that it is a great aviation program um, for our school district. All of the information that you will need as a coordinator and above is located on the school choice website. I would like to ask, that when we post our new school choice guide, that everyone please take the time to read it, to understand the process and the procedures that we go through on a yearly basis for 
for a moment because there are some misconceptions out there regarding our school choice departments. Uh, some people in our community are under the impression that we look at students with IEPs in a negative way when it comes to enrollment in our magnet programs, and that is not the case. We pride ourselves with diversity and inclusion. We do not even ask those questions on the application. Those questions come into play after the lottery, after the students are enrolled, to ensure that our schools are giving all of our students the services that they require. So please make sure that you're speaking the same language that's in our school choice guide. There's an application process. The deadline this year has been moved up for those of you that are interested in applying for your students or you know families out there. The application process will end December 1st. It moved up because we want to ensure that the other departments are not held up because of school choice. And that includes human resources, that includes business services. They have work to do. So we need to make sure that we are not hindering their progress. Future programs for school choice, please, please make sure that you are speaking to these new programs that we're going to have in our district. Uh, Arnold Elementary has completed an application for Cambridge Assessment International. Cambridge Assessment International, just so you know, it is very similar to the International Baccarat Program. Um, and also Elite Scholars completed an application, and I believe now Souter Elementary completed, it is Souter, correct? Completed an application for Cambridge. We will have Jonesboro Middle School, Jonesboro High School, and Lee Street Elementary will be seeking IB certification. Lee Street has already entered into the, into the candidacy phase, so they will be accepting students into that program for the 2019-2020 school year. Rivers Edge Elementary will begin their Chinese dual language magnet during the 2019-2020 school year, but Lake Ridge Elementary will begin French dual language magnet in 1920 school year. So those are our new programs. Our website is active, it's up, it is current. So please make sure, one, if you can do me any favor, please read the school choice guide when we upload it to our website. Thank you. the purpose 
purpose of our work. What does it mean to be of support? Then, we develop clear strategies within those conversations to support our schools. That is what is the circle of support. I didn't want to talk too much about it because Monday, we're going to have a whole day manipulating and working with the circle of support standard operating procedures and how is it that we are going to implement it next year. And you are going to be there Monday hearing more about it. So, next slide. My leaders, our leaders in the Division of Support Services are here. And uh, these are the, the, the areas of focus that they have for next year. The Department of Exceptional Students, I would like Trina Smith to stand up. She's right there. Um, we have increased, we are going to increase our instructional focus. What does that mean? For a long time, we've been focused on compliance. Compliance, compliance. Are we implementing those IEPs? Well, we need to focus on instruction. So when I uh, emphasize the word collaboration, we have been intentionally collaborating with the Department of Curriculum and Instruction to ensure that our special education students receive the quality of instruction that they need to receive in order to be successful. So another focus, another uh, word that you're going to be hearing a lot is Go IEP. Go IEP is a new platform. It's not new, but it's new to the district, uh, where we are going to be writing our IEPs. It's going to improve our process because it's going to have more, um, what do you call them, control strata to ensure that we write legal IEPs. That's very important for us. Um, we are going to increase collaboration with our community, our parents, increase our parental engagement and support to our parents. That is key for our, the parents of our students with disabilities. And uh, we are working on being more responsive and being more collaborative and engaging our parents more. That's going to be a big focus for next year. And of course, we work on our SIP plan. We receive a grant that is uh, a, to build capacity uh, for the uh, special needs department, and that is another focus in that area. Trina, would you like to add anything? Okay. All right. Um, our GX program. I'm not sure if Dr. Mr. Gilchrist is here. Thank you, Mr. Gilchrist. Mr. Gilchrist is continuing efforts to create a less restrictive learning environment. That is the focus of the GX program, and those efforts must continue. So. Uh, we are going to be monitoring the data very closely as to how many students we move out of that restrictive environment to a less restrictive environment. We are also going to expand our services with our current, current partnerships. What does that mean? We already know that we have partnerships out there and we see a lot of opportunity to improve and enhance those partnerships with our um, organizations that offer mental health services and support to our students. Homeless education program, Ms. Sonia Davis. I don't know if she's here today. Sonia, are you there? All right, we continue to raise awareness of our homeless students and what homelessness is. Um, that is a, we have, if you check the data, you would be surprised about the number of homeless students that we have in our data. Um, and the wonderful things that are being done for those students through the Homeless Education Program. So we will continue to educate the community on the program and on the services. I don't know if you've heard of the Orange Double Bag Program. How many of you have heard of that program? I don't think any of you have, some of you have. Um, that is um, a program of support for our most at-risk students. A lot of homeless students participate in that program. 
we had a great recognition uh, last year. The board recognized the, the students who completed the program. They go to Clayton State. And they, uh, the purpose of the program is for the students to create a plan for their future. And uh, if you see at the end of the program, each student receives a computer, a laptop computer, and they have to finish by saying what is it that they're going to do for their future. It's very, and we will continue expanding that program and supporting that program uh, uh, for our students. Psychological services. We are working on improving our students' social emotional health. Uh, as you know, uh, more and more we are dealing with uh, mental health concerns. It's not just in the Clayton County School, School District, it's a nationwide problem. Um, the, the young people that I have uh, interviewed and researched, they say it's all about the media, the social media. I don't know if that's the, the, the answer, but we do have a lot of uh, more students with mental health concerns and our psychological services department uh, is working on that. Expand this SAD program, Students Against Destructive Decisions. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with that program, familiar with that program, but it is a small program and it's a grant. It's a small program in the district, but we want to expand it. Uh, just this summer, a group of our students went to Washington, D.C. They got to travel on Delta. And they, um, and for most of them, they had never gone on a plane or gone out of the, um, of the county or the state of Georgia. They had a wonderful time and they learned a lot. They had contact with very high political figures, including uh, our first lady, and uh, that was through this, through the, through this program. Um, the second language learning program that, will, and of course, a very important piece is that we are um, increasing our efforts to implement MTSS. Uh, second language learning and those programs under second language learning is Title Three International. For languages um, is Dr. Normel. Dr. Normel, I believe she is in the federal programs office. Um, she will strengthen, she will uh, work on strengthening the programs to through professional development, strengthening language learning through quality professional development. That is uh, continuing the work. Um, she will also expand, continue to expand the dual language program. That's, there is a lot of, a, a big focus on expanding the dual language program in that area. We have added languages. We have added schools with the dual language program. It's very much supported and, and uh, we are very excited about uh, expanding the program for our students what it means uh, if we, if, when, when, when we talk about a global society, when we talk about the importance of the students being bilingual and bicultural, uh, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about um, expanding our offerings for dual language. Uh, Department of Discipline, uh, our uh, PBIS program is also being expanded and is also being a focus for next year. Uh, positive Behavior Intervention and Supports is part of the MTSS framework. And uh, we have, we are adding schools to the program. Uh, that is uh, very, very important when we talk about um, our focus on improving student behavior and preparing students to learn, to be in the classroom and to learn. Um, our our ISS, we, we also want to add um, improvement on our in-school suspension uh, program through uh, our behavior intervention specialists. Um, I don't know if you know that we have a group of, uh, a very capable group of behavior intervention specialists out there that add to uh, the behavior intervention specialists from the special education 
we are bringing them all together uh, to look next year into our in-school suspension um, classrooms. That's part of their duties and responsibilities is to walk through the in-school suspension classrooms and, and provide evidence-based interventions uh, to those um, paraprofessionals that are um, taking care, that are serving our students in those classrooms. Um, and of course, for the implementation, again, I, I, I repeated that of the MTSS framework. The Department of Student Services, Social Services, Hospital Homebound, and Health Services, we um, are developing and implementing a comprehensive wellness uh, model. And more information is to come in relation to that. We are uh, going to present that information soon. Um, and supporting the school-based centers uh, through our uh, grant with United Way. Um, this, the school-based centers, we, there is a grant for transportation and we expanded the services. And Dr. Calder is back there. I was looking for you, Dr. If you need to add anything, please. We, I invite you to do that. Um, through the United Way Transportation uh, Grant, we can serve more schools, we added, um, and we can serve more students because the students can be transported to our school-based center at the high school, North Clayton High School. North Clayton High School. The counseling program, supporting the implementation of site-based counseling program. Um, with the new um, master schedule, with removing the responsibility of building the master schedule from the counselor and also working on the registration process through the registrars. The counselors are working on enhancing their school-based counseling program. And there is going to be a focus on that. Um, we will continue to support DIORA. DIORA is a, um, a grant to support students, uh, to prepare students for careers. And uh, we will increase the participation of the students there is a goal to increase the participation of the students in the dual uh, enrollment program and in, co in collaboration with the Department of um, Curriculum and Instruction as well. Um, we are also uh, focusing on Rich Georgia. This year, our students are transitioning. Rich Georgia is a several multi-year grant and uh, that follows the students starting in the seventh grade. And now the students from Rich Georgia are transitioning into the ninth grade. So the students for the first year are going to be in high school. That's a very, very important job. And we are working with the high schools to support the Rich Georgia program. And I think that's it. It's a lot. I think I'm say it. Well, thank you very much. Since this is the Unity group, I think we need to shorten this one like this. Good morning. Good morning. I want to talk just a moment about uh, hiring and vacancies, which is on the agenda. And uh, in terms of our staffing goal, obviously we have a goal of being 100% staffed in terms of teachers. Um, at this point, we're a little short of that goal. Um, this data is uh, as of yesterday. We're about 95.7% staffed. And we've got two weeks left to go, so each day we're working to try to increase that number to 100%. Uh, thanks again to the assistant superintendents and our principals who are now here today for working with us collaboratively to uh, improve that number. Uh, for those classrooms that at this point we haven't been able to secure a teacher for, we've worked with our principals to secure either a, a short-term sub or a long-term sub until we can hire the right person for that job. This is just some of our key work and human resources I want to bore you with that. These are some of the areas that we're responsible for in terms of our work and compliance. I want to talk more about our priorities for the upcoming school year. 
One of the things that you may hear often is, which kind of correlates to the vacancies that we have in place and in other metro school systems and school systems across the nation, is that there's a shortage of teachers. We're going to take a different approach to that in terms of that. It may not be a necessarily shortage of teachers. There is a shortage of retaining the employees that we have. We have a lot of good employees in place. And so we're going to place focus on how do we retain those employees that we have in the school system. So it will be led by the Division of Human Resources, but obviously we're going to collaborate with other departments and divisions throughout the school district who assist us in retaining primarily our teachers, but all employees in the district. So you'll hear more about the retention task force uh, as the year progresses. We're also going to take a look at our recruitment strategies and efforts to make certain that we are uh, maximizing our return on our investment in terms of the dollars and the resources that we have to uh, commit to recruitment, to make certain that we are recruiting in, in the right places, the right colleges and universities, to better our opportunities of securing teachers in the areas that we need. And lastly, um, there's a meeting coming up which we're really pleased of. I think it's next week, uh, next Monday, whereby you know, each year uh, the majority of our employees are evaluated uh, throughout the school year. And we're working for utilizing that data uh, to various departments and divisions to assist in guiding discussions and decisions that relate to uh, curriculum instruction and professional development throughout the district. So in, in many school districts, and you may see that again, the evaluations are done, but we're going to try to take it a little bit farther than compliance and simply doing the evaluation. We're going to work collaboratively again with departments and divisions to ensure that that data is being used uh, to guide discussions and decisions throughout the school district. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Thomas Trevor. I'm the Chief of Safety and Security. And I want to start by stating that uh, Safety and security supports the notion that there are two types of employees in the district. We have those who teach and those who support teachers. And we definitely want to make sure that we play our role in support. And I think support starts by establishing the assignments. And for our high schools, we have uh, each high school, with the exception of three, and I'll go over those three, are assigned two SROs and two CSOs. Now we have Elite Scholars, the Perry Center, and of course we have uh, Stillwell, who currently have an assignment of one and one, which is one CSO and one SRO. But depending on the population, especially when we look at the Perry Center, we might have to adjust those numbers, so we constantly modify that. And we strategically look at the staff. As a matter of fact, we had a meeting, we had two meetings last week, where we really sat down and looked at the, the balance. We looked at the culture of the school to determine which officers were best fit for the particular schools and the, and the CSOs for those environments to make sure that we can maximize our opportunities to keep the students safe. So we're gonna keep doing that. We're gonna keep monitoring and adjusting as necessary. We're also going to continue our safe school searches. You know, last year in the country, we had a few school shootings and some other incidents that occurred. So what we want to do is deploy those school searches to attempt to keep weapons out of our schools. If we can keep the weapons out of our schools, we can decrease that fear, and we can have more instructional uh, proficiency going on in the classroom. Game awareness and criminal procedure assemblies. Uh, it, it, this is a problem that's plaguing us in America, not just in Clayton County and in the state of Georgia, but gangs are a problem throughout the United States. And we feel our efforts would be better suited if we started to approach the middle school area and put emphasis on the middle school students so that we can change that mindset and really get them before they're entrenched into that gang environment, which we all know once they're in, is really difficult getting them out of that environment. The tip line, and I know you all can't see this uh, card from here, but the tip line is a line that anybody in the district can go on, it's an app, and it's on our um, district mobile app, I think that's what it is, uh, isn't that right, Rob? 
but anyone can go on and you can launch different complaints or different situations or different circumstances that are safety related. And some of the drop boxes are associated with bullying, drugs, fighting, um, personal issues, um, relationships, whether it's student, teacher, or personnel. So I encourage you all to load it up on your phone, and if you see the situation, please let us know. You can maintain your anonymity, or you can put who you are. And the best thing about it is, it goes to the school resource office, and it comes to me directly so that we can go in and mitigate the challenges. Now I want to give you some updates on some of the training that we went through and we've been participating in. But I think the one that's most important for me is the first one. I'm pleased to say that 95% of our SROs are nationally certified. Now I want to give them a hand for that. That's vital. And what it does, getting that national certification, first of all, it instills a different mindset in the officers. One thing that we cannot have is a us against them mentality. We can't have that. We're there to support the students, the teachers, staff, central office, everybody in the district. And I think with the training that they went through, it gave them an opportunity to see the totality of what it is that school resource officers should be doing from a national perspective. So I'm really pleased that we went through the training. We also had 33% of the command to go through the training as well with the intent of having everyone from the chief down certified by the end of this academic year. So I'm really, really happy with that opportunity. And we've done active shooter training, we've done gang resistance and education training, emergency preparedness, uh, mindset training, which is valuable. Uh, we started that last August and we're gonna continue that training. Absolutely paramount to do that. And of course, juvenile court case law updates because as you know, the laws are currently changing, especially when it relates to custody, what we can do, um, who should have access to a student, and so forth and so on. So we have to maintain that knowledge to make sure that we can assist the others in doing the right thing as it relates to our students. Again, some additional training, uh, the active shooter response, uh, emergency operation plans updates. Now this is important. I want to talk about this just for a second because we're looking at the emergency operations plans. And the reason why we're doing this is we want to make sure not only that the police officers know what their responsibilities are, but the students and the staff are also aware. And we also want to conduct some practices as well. So you're going to see that in the upcoming year because in the uh, situation in Florida, a part of the problem, not just that one, but the one that they had in Dalton, right here in the state of Georgia, a part of the challenges were the staff and the students didn't know what they were supposed to do. So we have to sure that up. We have to make sure not only that the officers are aware of what their responsibilities are, but that the staff and students are aware as well. And then we have to make some other modifications too because of how the shooters are using different components of the school to get to gather students to get them to accept them. So we have some more work that we're going to do with that, but it's in the upcoming year, and just look forward to it. And please don't see it as a burden. Please don't see it as a burden. Because I always say this, it's not if, it's when. And when it happens, or if it happens to us, I want to make sure that we know what we're doing so that we can maximize the safety of the vast population. So please work with us on that. Some updates. The one thing that I that really brought me a, a great deal of grief last year was the number of suicides we had. So what we're looking at is proposing um, and working along with uh, Ms. Dawkins' team, the communication team, and, and other teams to create an anti-suicide PSA. You know, I think we have to do something to recognize that our young people are having challenges that are causing to them to result to suicide. And sometimes they're warning signs, sometimes they aren't, but most occasions there are those little things that stick out that we may or may not recognize, but we should be very vigilant in trying to 
give our students an outlet, someone to speak to. And if we do the video, if we do it correct, maybe we can expose some situations that cause students to go that route. And maybe we can mitigate that. We're also looking at the Junior Cadet Safety Program in elementary schools. And, and that really aligns with the last bullet. What we did last year is uh, we put nine CSOs in the elementary schools that had the most calls of service. And it really worked out in our benefit because from a data perspective, we saw decreases in the number of incidents at those schools. So what we want to do this year is increase that number by at least six more elementary schools and hopefully we'll get the same outcomes. And we also want to change that mentality because when we're in the elementary schools, if we can win them over now, and you guys know the culture in America right now, people don't like law enforcement very much. But I want to change that culture because we're here to serve and protect. And I want our babies to know that don't run from us, run to us when you have a crisis. So when we create programs like the Junior Cadet Safety Program, which are in elementary schools, and if we have a safety control program, that gives them an opportunity to participate. And I'm pleased to say that they're really pleased with assisting and working with us in these programs. So uh, again, these are a few of the things that uh, initiatives we're working on. Uh, we're pleased with the outcomes thus far, and we're planning on having an outstanding year this year. Thank you.
So purchasing, their goal is to help you get the things that the students need. Within budget, we will all do it together. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact any of us, and we are very happy that Stanton is here. So we will be working with her, getting her up to speed on the budget and all of our plans for this year. Um, if you have, again, any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Good morning. I'm going to stand over here because Anthony forgot to put my step stool so you won't be able to see me if I stand behind the phone. He had to joke about me before he got a chance to do it. So, um, we, <clears throat> we have a lot of things going on in the technology department. Um, and one of the things I really want to highlight before I go over my next 15 slides is <laughs> not true. Um, but we only highlighted two things. But we do have a lot of things that are going on in the technology department. Many of you, when you come up and you present to the audience or to the group, you mention things that we're involved in. We're involved in the MUNIS um, implementation. We're involved with Dr. Nunez's as group relative to working with the counselors and trying to get uh, better data into the, to the uh, student information system, Infinite Campus. So, before I actually highlight the two things that we want to highlight for the group, I want to take this opportunity to say that we work as a team. There are three people that report directly to me. We have weekly meetings. We call ourselves the core four, Dr. Beasley. And the core four are responsible for three separate, separate areas. And I want to introduce those people. Many of you already know. I'm like Dr. Beasley said, this is some of the practice sessions, so they may come to those other sessions. So I want to, I want to introduce um, April Mayo, Director of Instructional Technology, if you will raise your hand. Uh, Wes Watkins, Director of Technical Operations, responsible for the network and the uh, laptop computers that you guys uh, use on your desk. Then Howard Langford and his team, responsible for the student information systems, and they're very involved right now in the uh, MUNIS implementation, just to name a couple of things. But not to eat up all my time, and try to be respectful to Jada's um, uh, directive to keep this down to about two or three minutes. Um, we're really excited about this one big initiative, this extended learning beyond the classroom. Last year, we won a lot of Dr. Beasley's critical conversations. Many of the students who came to those critical conversations talked about, we want or we'd like to have uh, computers to take home. Many school districts call this initiative or initiative like this a one-to-one -one initiative. We stayed away from using that verbiage all together. With an intentional focus on instruction, we titled it uh, Extending Learning Beyond the Classroom because really the focus is not on the technology. What we're really trying to do is increase engagement, access, communication, and collaboration with that intentional focus on learning. It's just a tool, okay? Um, Really, you can see the goal yourself, but Dr. Beasley, when we first had this conversation, he said, Brock, can we do this? So, you know, got back with the team and we started looking at ways we could implement this. And we talked about which grade level should we start with. So, a lot of work went into the planning. We think we landed on the right model, um, grades three through 12. I think in four years, we should be there as the goal. Um, and what we're going to start doing, and you'll see some of those computers that we purchased for the extended learning beyond the classroom start to be repurposed and they'll go back down to some of the lower grades, kindergarten and first grade, so that even those students will have a one-to-one -one life experience. They won't take them home, okay, but teachers can start assigning those computers to the, or laptops to those students um, during the instructional day. Um, we have a... Uh, a very extensive frequently asked questions list. So when we do this presentation for community leaders and stakeholders, they can go there. Things like insurance, what are we gonna do about insurance for computers? What are we gonna do work on safety and security in terms of lost and stolen devices? We have and thought about answers for all of those. So we're really excited about this because we think that um, based on those conversations that Dr. Beasley had, had last year, Many of our surrounding school districts are already doing something similar to a, what, again, a one-to-one, -one, what we're calling now is extended learning beyond the classroom. 
We're using four pilot schools. You can see those schools. These schools were, were um, um, chosen. The principals have been briefed. They've come to a meeting. We've had great support from uh, the area superintendents and Dr. Uh, Smith and uh, Dr. Simpson relative to helping us select the right principals to do this first pilot year. And they're extremely excited about it. Oh, thank you, David. The next thing that we want to highlight for the community is our digital classroom re refresh. About five years ago when I first came on board, in the classrooms, basically what we had was projectors, okay? We had some student response systems, document cameras, um, what else, and slates, and panels. okay, thank you. Um, the, the problem with that, and the problem with solutions like that, and I, and I use that word loosely because it really wasn't a solution. It was kind of a hodgepodge of devices that were selected and placed in the classroom without any real focus on the structure. We went through a long process, and I know Lisa mentioned uh, an RFP. We went through a long uh, process for an RFP with the purchasing department to select the solution we had. One of the things that, that, that I like about this solution is all the devices in the classroom work under one software umbrella, right? So a teacher doesn't have to jump out of one application and then come back in um, to do anything or, or to uh, conduct instruction. Um, if they have old files from their, the previous solution, those files get integrated seamlessly into this new solution. Um, each classroom, I think, will have, and we looked at about, and we're estimated at about 3,200 classrooms will get these new devices. And primarily, every classroom is going to get uh, IFP, which is an interactive flat panel. Uh, we didn't have enough gloss dollars to outfit every classroom with all the devices, so we came up with a percentage for those classrooms that, uh, that, that are outside of that percentage, so to speak. And I think what we've done now is uh, working with uh, title, uh, the title director, that we may be able to, uh, or should be able to uh, supplement some of those. Those are things like document cameras, student response systems. Um, I think we're getting a slate for every classroom. Those are the kind of devices that uh, Katrina Thompson and her group are going to help supplement um, to fill the, those gaps. Um, Overall, the project should be complete sometime, we estimate, in, in February. Those dates could slide because you know technology, uh, things happen. Um, right now, we're working on an issue. We don't think it's going to have a major impact on the implementation, but you, you never know. So that's the estimated date right now. Um, the one other thing that I think I did not highlight that Dr. Simpson and uh, I talked about the last time that we met was that we're really trying to do a better job this year are getting parents to take advantage of the uh, Infinite Campus Parent Portal. We want parents to, to use that portal consistently to go and view their students' grades, their attendance. You can see everything that a parent needs to see. And the one thing that I, I shared with uh, Jayla when we talked about this presentation was if we're a high-performing school district, we want high-performing parents. So we need our high-performing parents to take advantage of that Infinite Campus uh, parent portal so that we can increase that utilization and see those numbers go up. I will say this, um, prior to Dr. Beasley coming on board, we were seeing roughly around 4,000 users uh, during that first year before Dr. Beasley came on. We saw a huge increase last year. I think that utilization went up to about 20,000. We had a little bit of a drop this past school year, dropped down to about 18, so we know we had to make a stronger effort to get those numbers back up. If 55,000 students, we should at least have 55,000 parents or guardians logging into Infinite Campus on a regular basis to, to um, take a look at their students' information. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.
challenge. But we are uh, in transportation and operation. We have uh, a method of getting that done. We right now, we have got about 365 school bus routes and drivers on hand, ready to go. Come August, first, first week in August. The average uh, route time when we get to school is 98% of the time we're there on time. Uh, as you all know, and you can hear in Clayton, east and west, we got a railroad track. That thing is a menace to my school buses because we trip it. As we start trying to get through the school on time, guess what? The train comes on time. And we have to stop with the train. But we do get students to school 98% of the time. Well, the students will be arriving from the state of the art school bus again this year. And what they will have on them, as usual, our condition for our students. We're going to have wireless video cameras on the inside of the school bus. We also have a camera system that we've got on the outside of the school bus. And that camera system is designed to get students to school safely when they have a school bus stop. Sometimes cars feel like they want to come around and stop home. We want to try to deter that as much as possible. So the uh, leadership in the uh, district has okayed me to be able to put at least 100 cameras on the outside of those school buses to make sure that we can get students to school safely. We, almost all, we also have two-way radio systems. Two-way radio systems on those school buses to record that when we want to call and talk to the school bus driver directly to help, to, you know, to support students to get to the front of school safely as well. We also got GPS systems that we track the school bus where the school bus is at. We do not track human beings. We track school buses. To keep that clear. Uh, we also got wheelchair accessible for our, uh, for our special needs students. And we also got the emission control system, which will uh, promote good, clean air on school buses. Our children's not breathing diesel fuels and that kind of stuff on the school buses. They pretty well clean buses. Some of the things that some of the uh, service that we provide, I think you all know now, I work with everybody in here, is that we are uh, AADS, the School of the Dell. Do anybody can raise their hand and tell me where that school is, where that school is located at? Where that school is located at? I mean, that school bus driver be from Clayton County and got to travel to work I-20 every single morning. And we get there on time every single morning, navigating through the I-20 track. We got the alternative uh, students, our special needs students. We got our CTAE programs that we take to school on time every morning. Exceptional children's students, uh, extracurricular, all your football game, basketball game, all this getting ready to start, we're going to be you know, on time with that. The GAB, School of the Blind. Can anybody here tell me where that school is at? What about Macon, Georgia? We also get them to school on time in Macon, Georgia. Uh, twice, uh, that's twice a, a, a week we go around there. We got the Mac and Zion Art programs. Uh, we, we service the regular education student population and then obviously the transitional students, our homeless students. We, uh, we do all that to make sure that we can get to school on time. And what you all can do for me to help me is this right here. The school bus drivers got a culture that nobody cares for them. So every time that you all have an opportunity to pass a school bus driver on the back, I really do appreciate it. And let them know that they are also appreciated. And I guarantee you what, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get to school on time this year. Thank you very much.
what we try to do is we make sure that the schools know that these custodians are accountable to them and their expectations are what these custodians should be. And we need to make sure that we raise those expectations of our custodians. And we help in, in that effort uh, with the uh, technical su uh, support. Uh, we even provide uh, custodial support when most of or some of our uh, positions are vacant through the FMLA or long-term absences. Uh, school building housekeeping. Uh, we do a continuous assessment of our schools uh, through assessing uh, the glass floors, grounds, uh, plumbing, uh, restrooms. Uh, so we're always visiting our facilities to make sure that not only the school administrators uh, know what's expected, but their custodians are uh, in congruence with what the, our expectations are as a district. Grounds maintenance. Uh, grounds maintenance is, isn't just cutting the grass around the facility. That also involves uh, pine straw, uh, filling potholes, graffiti uh, around the buildings and the facilities. So that misconception of what's expected, uh, expected of our grounds uh, a crew has a lot more uh, activities associated with that uh, function. This year, uh, we have a, a high priority focus on our HVAC uh, infrastructure. Uh, last year, we, um, we, had a, we had a reasonable start, but not a start that uh, we wanted for our school district. Uh, so what we did is we partnered with a training company, which is the manufacturer of about 80% of our HVAC infrastructure. And we've been having monthly meetings with them and coordinating some manpower support, as well as working with our construction department in identifying some of those high uh, priority or high problem areas. I think we're going to renovate uh, HVAC systems in six schools this year. So we should see a measurable difference in our HVAC performance this fall. Uh, uh, that added with additional uh, manpower in that group, as well as the monthly continuous meetings with not only training, but our school administrators making sure that we're providing a comfortable learning environment for our students. Uh, the warehouse operations. Warehouse, uh, our warehouse uh, facility holds all of our critical inventory, paper, housekeeping items, textbooks, technology, and the support supplies for all of our skilled trades. Uh, we believe that with the implementation of units, we will be better uh, positioned to efficiently manage that inventory and control the inflow and outflow of that inventory. So we're really looking forward, forward to the benefits of that uh, system as it uh, gets integrated into our activities. I'll uh, uh, refer to the school nutrition as Hamilton. Good morning, everyone. The school nutrition department support student academics, our strategic plan, our strategic goal by making sure that our students have a hot and cold breakfast and lunch when they arrive to school every day. And these are some things that we're going to do this year, 2018-19, in order to support student achievement. School Nutrition, thanks to our board this past spring, renewed our community eligibility provision program, which is CEP, to ensure that all students, regardless of income, is able to receive a free breakfast, lunch, and snack at no cost through school year 2022. I'm gonna skip bullet number two and jump to three. We also this year renewed our fresh fruit and vegetable program, which means that we now have seven, 10 schools that are participating in our fresh fruit and vegetable program. In 2008, when we started, we started out with five. 
Then we went to seven. Now we have 10 schools participating. These schools allow students, this program allows students to receive fresh fruit and vegetables that they generally will not receive in the regular school nutrition program. For example, we serve pension berries from South America. We offer asparagus as a way for them to taste and sample other fruits and vegetables, blood oranges, as well as radishes, to name a few of the items that we serve in the fresh fruit and vegetable program. Also, we started a new pilot of mobile carts in seven of our middle schools. This is a national phenomenon that's taking place all across the country, breakfast in alternative locations. Some people call it breakfast in the classroom. We just call it breakfast in alternative locations where students can actually pick up breakfast items from a mobile cart away from the cafeteria. They're able to eat in other locations. We have seven middle schools that participated in this program and they're doing it very, very well. The students really work hard to make sure that they pick up after themselves, they clean after themselves, and that pest control is not an issue for these schools. So we're excited about that. And also, finally, we want to talk about our new employee training kitchen. For the first time this year, we're rolling it out fully with our staff. This is a program located at the Perry Learning Academy. It's designed to give our staff, new and existing staff, an opportunity to obtain professional development that meets federal, state, and local standards. And so we're rolling that out. And I have our chef here, Chef Jabbar. If you will please stand, introduce yourself. Chef Jabbar is responsible for that train. Right, wave your hand. He's responsible for the train facility and make sure that our staff is knowledgeable of food preparation to make sure that we are serving healthy meals to our students. Also for my team, I have Ms. Ingrid Faradale. Ingrid, if you can stand, raise your hand. Ingrid is responsible for our menu, nutrient analysis, our bids, our procurement of all of our menus and items in order to serve our students. And also we have Dr. Yutande Alati, and she's responsible for the, the implementation of the community eligibility program, the after school snack program, the summer meal services program, as well as our technology program. Ms. Lucy Bell Logan is not here with us. She's our newest coordinator to the team. She is at the uh, new director's training this morning, offered by the Georgia Department of Education. She's responsible for the training as, all, as well as the wellness. And thank you very much, Stephanie Poo School of Nutrition, at this time. Good morning. 
Uh, my name is Ronnie Joseph. I'm the director of construction. Uh, far as lost live updates, uh, half your board, we just played elementary school was open in August 2013, uh, 2018, excuse me. Uh, have the ribbon cutting ceremony scheduled for July 31st uh, at 5 30. Please attend. Uh, other accomplishments include uh, HHF raids at uh, two high schools as well as four middle schools. Um, for the upcoming school year, expect renovations at Jumpville High School, Riverdale High, North Plate Middle, Addison Middle, Cedar Compassion, and Arnold Elementary Schools. Um, work is ongoing at the KR Pace School of the Arts. And we are expecting an opening in January 2019. Uh, SPLOS 5 will expire in December 2019, which leads us to SPLOS 6. For SPLOS 6, simply, uh, I cannot tell you uh, how to vote or should or, or to vote, uh, but I can tell you, inform you the results of a yes vote. Uh, the, the board has called for a special election on March 19, 2019. Uh, on the ballot, you will see that we're calling for capital projects, a STEM elementary school, a STEM middle school, and a STEM high school, as well as a college and career academy. Uh, SPLOS 6 will also fund uh, new buses, <coughs> as well as the technology improvements. All in all, we're looking at $280 million for maximum revenues. Collect collections will occur from January 2020 to December 2024. Thank you for your time. Really, really. Big. 
been some movement there and stakeholders going in on our website and utilizing the Infinite Campus platform to share and exchange key information about what's happening in our school system. And we also have a YouTube channel. If you want to go back and look at videos from the past things that we've done and we can post it, not only can you go to the website, but you can go to our YouTube channel and we'll share more of that information as we start the new school year. Uh, printing services is actually uh, supervised by the communications team. And so I'm sure many of you by now have uh, utilized Mr. Hill's service chief supervisor for that particular department. And we would like for you to just know one thing as we start the new school year. Please, if you have uh, special documents or information that you would like publicized or, or created in advance, please put those requisitions out there in advance. There's a lot of departments that, that utilize the service and, and go to her quite often to get information. So we, I know that I've heard some complaints of we will listen to your concerns, but if you would like for rapid turnaround, we advise you to please, please, please share that information in advance and make sure that we are critiquing the information so we can cut down the number of errors and supplies that, are, that we're discovering that becomes a little wasteful and ink and all of that that's costing the district. So let's be good stewards of all of our services and supplies. In addition to that, we will continue to train and identify sources to help with professional development within our division to help support you and to help support our stakeholders district-wide. Customer service. This is something that actually developed I think in light of our community meetings, we have noticed from a lot of our external stakeholders that it's just, um, it's important that we deliver the type of service that we expect in return. And I just believe, I'm just an old fashioned young lady from Alabama, and I was always told to treat people how you desire to be treated. And that's the kindness and being respectful and being able to respond promptly whatever is being uh, requested of you. So oftentimes, we've heard a lot of complaints about delays and responding and getting information back. And believe it or not, those complaints oftentimes come to the communications department. You know, they think that we, are, we have, uh, I guess, a, a, a telephone system that's connected to all departments. So oftentimes, we get those, those complaints. So I would like advise everyone to just exercise some customer, some great customer service in the new school year, and we are going to spearhead that effort in trying to identify just a, a policy of protocols and guidelines that help govern what's the best method of customer service for the school district. And we will be reaching out to you with surveys and sharing and exchanging information to make sure that we're creating this document, this, this guideline that governs us all. So be, stay tuned for that. And community engagement. We will continue to heighten our efforts and opportunities as such with our internal and external stakeholders and conducting meetings to share critical information, highlight initiatives and activities that's taking place within the school district. And one of the things that I'd like to announce um, that's new this year is the, the, the superintendent community uh, advisory group that is the high performing advisory team and, and they will be responsible for working with us to dis discover how can we better perfect, I guess, our gifts, our talents, and all of our services to help our students and staff and community as a whole. That group is, is uniquely designed to make sure that they're working specifically with the superintendent to highlight everything that's important. Um, one of the things that we have realized with all of them, we have about nine community advisory groups uh, at this time. I think it's, it consists of elected officials, we have ministers. Um, in addition to that, we have staff members. But this particular advisory group will be keenly responsible for working with us to identify what it means, helping us define what it means to be a high-performing school district. So we are extremely excited about that new advisory that's added to the superintendent's advisory meetings this year. And we will continue to build bridges with our press corps. Many of you know we've had probably some balanced, I would say, stores this past.
past school year. Um, some were favorable and some were a little challenging. Um, as a matter of fact, the superintendent is hosting the first ever meeting with our editorial um, press corps tomorrow morning. And this opportunity is to sit down and share and exchange, again, key information with those uh, general managers, reporters, editors, and all of those who are responsible for these news stories that you see uh, displayed on our television stations and our newspapers. So for the first time, our superintendent will be sitting down with all of these key affiliates and sharing ways that we not only um, would love for them to highlight the positive things that's happening in Clayton County Public Schools, but in addition to sharing what they need from us. Because a lot of times, you know, I think it's just frowned upon for reporters to come and, and sit and, and, and interview us and share what's happening, but we should utilize that opportunity to really do a spin around, to share positive things, what's happening. So I want to go into this new school year, and our leader wants to go into this new school year, not only I guess working with our internal stakeholders, but working with the individuals who are really, really responsible for our viewership and knowing that we are doing some incredible things and hoping that they will help us highlight those amazing things that each of us are doing to support our staff and students in our community. So that's really it in a nutshell. We will continue to highlight things and share with you throughout the year. Many of you have asked for video services um, we lost a few members of our team relative um, who were responsible for making sure that we, we conduct video packages for you. But if you contact us, we will work with you and identify people who are still instrumental uh, that, that are able to help us highlight what you're doing respectfully within your division. So that's it, and I will turn things back over to our wonderful leader, Dr. Morrissey J. Beasley, and thank you for your time today.
So timing is everything. Timing and everything is everything. And so just want you all to be aware of that. Any major questions before we let you go? Any major questions that you have that you just feel like you need an answer to today before we leave here? I just got to know this. I just got to know this. So I'll just, uh, if, if we don't, I'll just say that we appreciate all that you're doing. I want you to really think about it. And again, those of us who are going to cross-functional cross -functional today will have an, an opportunity to engage uh, around our definition of high performance. But I want you to think about where you are in your department, where your department is, what metrics you're using to, to ascertain whether or not you're moving in the right direction. Think about your actions and continue to work together. That's the key, collaborate, communication. Uh, it's, it's important, so important as we support our schools that we are on the same team. We may have differences of opinion. Grown folk do that. Children do that. We are all humans do that. But at the end of the day, we have to land. Uh, we have to build consensus towards what's the direction, the approach that we're going to take, and we have to go in that direction together. It's called coherence. We all know the vision. We know the position that we or the role that we fulfill on the team, and we work in a coherent fashion to achieve those goals. So anybody in here not clear about the work that we have been doing, the work that we're engaged in to achieve high levels of performance? You saw quite a bit of work. You didn't hear a lot of programs. You saw programs and getting into work, but what you saw was work, the work that we're doing. Uh, to achieve high levels of performance, whether it directly impacts what's occurring in the classroom, directly impacts what's occurring in the schools, or that directly impacts what's occurring systemically in the entire school system. So, I hope you have a great year. I know you will. We want you to take full advantage of these opportunities that will be afforded throughout the year. Work closely with your division, your supervisor, to ensure that if there are issues, get those issues addressed. You know, sometimes I notice sometimes people will bring up issues that are meaning, and they you've held the issue for three months, and you had all these other people you could have gone to about the issue to bring it to a meeting. Is that my question is why didn't you take that to somebody and get that resolved? Because if you're having that issue, probably somebody else is what? having that same issue. So get it what? Resolved. I often tell the team that when we meet, we're not here to bring up problems. Because if you knew the problem existed, you should have, don't wait till you come to a meeting. Figure out what needs to get the right people around the table. Figure out what the problem is, the root cause, and do your analysis, etc. Get the solution implemented. And when you come to the meeting, tell us what the problem was and what the solution was and how it's going. Does that make sense? And so, and, and see, that's how you create that culture of high performance. So I want to encourage all of us to be mindful of that. Work with your other departments and your other uh, divisions to that end. Keep our focus on our children, what's good for our children. And I believe, I know we will, I know we'll have a great year. Remember, it's about creating a culture of high performance. We create the culture that we appreciate. If there's going to be a, a success story in urban America, an urban school system, why not Clayton County? We can do it if we believe it, if our actions align with what we believe, we can do it. It's bigger than me, it's bigger, bigger than all of us individually, but collectively, we understand that our actions are so important to the outcome that we want our children to experience every day in our schools. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you all. Have a great day. Enjoy your lunch. And for those of you that are coming to CFT, we'll see you at 3 p.m. at CFT.